Hey, man. Hey, how's it going? Good, good, good. All right, so, let me see. Um, okay. Are you, all right, let me see. Like, are you, I wonder if, how do I tell if we're picking up this mic? Does it, how does the audio quality sound? It sounds, sounds all right, actually, yeah. All right, cool. All right, so then that's, that's it. We got, you, you do video as well? Yeah, I'll record the Skype call for us to, and then I'll clip it down and put it on YouTube as well. Cool, awesome. All right, so then I will make sure we get like all the, all the cool background shit in my cool, that is cool. Lo- layer here. Is that wallpaper? Or is it all drawn on? It's drawn. So, it's drawn on. So, so check this out. So this is in my in my apartment building. So this is what's called the jam room. It's like an actual audio recording studio. Sweet. And so yeah, all the stuff is like drawn on the walls, and so it's it's very interesting. It's very cool. Um, that looks real good. Yeah, so yeah, so it's like a nice little little background here that we, that we've got. So I'll do that. Sweet. Um, How does my audio sound, by the way? Because I'm going uh, through. Yeah, I'm picking you up through the through the headphones. It's fine. Cool. I don't know what it is. I've got this microphone here, but it's just not wanting to play ball. Yeah. Today. Have, have you have you used it before? Yeah, it's just stopped working. It's got the light so, on it. So if you if you go to um if you look at your Skype window yeah. and click on Skype and then go to audio and video settings, you can probably just make sure that it's, it's yeah it's not in the up. list anymore. Oh, that's, that's weird. weird. Maybe that's very strange. Yeah, it's been doing it for a couple of days, so we shall see. Um, is there anything you want to go through, like specifically that you're working on? Um, I mean, honestly, like the the writing stuff and the writing yeah. coaching, all of that is really um the big stuff that I'm that I'm focusing on in terms of like business in terms of fitness stuff um you know it's uh, I, you know I'm kind of in that old man phase where I just like I'm not doing anything crazy um intense or and, yeah. and it's just it's like interesting so you know I have this whole thing I, I put up this Facebook post that we can talk or this uh, Instagram post that we can talk about where my friend David Delanave talks about uh fitness very much like um, oh shit! Hold on. Wait, I wonder if I could use this. Like, this is all sorts of cool stuff. Hold on, let me let me put these on. These look okay. cool. Give me one sec. All right. All right. One moment. Like that. I'm gonna plug these in. There we go. Cool. Yeah. Definitely in the recording studio now. All right, how's that, Lynn? Let me get an audio test. Let me hear you. Yep. All good? Oh, that's great. Oh, that's great. Sweet. Oh, yeah, this is, yeah, this is so much fun. <laughs> so anyway, Delanave talks about how um, fitness and, and finances are very similar in that <clears throat> if you invest a fuck ton when you're young, you can kind of coast when you're when you're a little bit older. And so that's sort of what I've been doing now. So we can talk about that. Um, yeah, oh, was it was know. it the post that not been to the gym? That, uh, yes. That yeah, one. that was it. That's the one. Yeah. Cool. And also the one before that about it's actually okay to want to change your body. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I'll, I'm just going to leave your Instagram up there and then go through that. I think that touching on things that the actual modern man nowadays compared to the modern man in the 80s yeah uh, what has actually happened with us with, with hormonal levels and stuff like that touching on the entrepreneurial world um why people are so busy uh, and using that as an excuse like what they can actually do mm-hmm. uh looking a little bit like when you mentioned about the hero's journey before mm-hmm. and how that's actually fit into your life with fitness at the moment sure yeah absolutely because i think that would be pretty cool to, to go on that um so we'll go for a quick introduction and then do you want to mention the mastermind stuff is that the writing stuff we're going to look at yeah yeah we'll yeah. do that for sure yeah i'll put that down there cool and we shall just see see where we go you haven't got to worry about swearing or any of that on here it's all good Perfect. i noticed there was a couple of the podcasts you've been on and they're edited out yeah, yeah. Every now and again, they're just like, "Oh, there's he has some salty language." I'm like, "Oh, I, don't know. I like I I guess so many of my friends are from the UK and Australia. Like, just saying cunt is like second yeah, nature to me. It's just normal. <laughs> Americans are like, "Oh no, we can't." <laughs> yeah. That that one you can't have. It is it's absolutely nuts. Let me just make sure this one. Yeah. 
we're recording in Skype recorder and I'm using GarageBand as well because Adobe Audition didn't want to work either, which was handy. Yeah, all right. All right, well, I'm good to go. Yeah, let's go for it. So aim around like 30, 40 minutes, see where we're at and then go cool. from there. Cool. Okay, hello guys and welcome back to the Revitalization Blueprint podcast. We're here with a very special guest. I said I was going to get some really cool people on board and we have got the man, man 2.0 himself, John Romanello. How are we doing? I am doing really well, thank you so much. Good, good. All the way over, you are in New York at the moment, aren't you? I am in the greatest city in the world, in New York, yeah. And the coolest room in the world with a big banana on the wall. Is her, yeah. Oh wow, we got all sorts of weird shit back there. <laughs> it's just random, so, just having a massive picture of a banana. So yeah. we, we've got. But we've also got Beyonce back there. So like, B. Beyonce. What's, what's the middle one? Uh, I don't. I don't actually know who that is. It's some reasonably attractive woman who I. That might like kind of. No, it's some some. Yeah. Just, just having music. two women and a banana. Well, yeah. Which we'll is, see that. Which is pretty fitting for my life, as it is. <laughs> exactly. Is that I, I was going to go through what. On your website, John Romanello is a level 70 orc wizard who spends his days <laughs> lifting heavy shit and his nights fighting crime. When oh. not doing that, he serves as the chief bro king of, Ro- of the Roman Empire and executive editor on RFS. So you can read his articles on Roman fitness systems. How true is that to this day? Uh, well, I mean, you know, these days I am not really playing a lot of World of Warcraft. My level 70 orc wizard is, is pretty dormant. But, yeah, that is, it's fairly accurate. I, I do spend much of my day lifting heavy shit. Or not, actually not nearly as much as I used to. I spend a lot of my day writing about heavy shit. And, uh, I do, I do fight crime at night. Um, although, I, you know, I, uh, these days I, I like to think of myself functioning more as, um, uh, less of the like the Superman fighting crime and more of like the Jor El operating in the Fortress of Solitude teaching people how to fight crime. And that's so you know, like I take my mentoring very, very seriously. A virtual reality sort of side of yes, things. Yes, very much. That's cool. That's cool. Um, just thrown off exactly what I was going to go through there, we're just like going through the Superman thing straight away. Tell, tell the guys, I mean, most of the people will know about you. If they don't, then they need to sure. just sort their lives out a little bit. But we've got <laughs> the book from 2012, did you say it was? Uh, 2013. 2013, Man 2.0, which engineer in the alpha. And the full title being Unlock the Secret to Burn Fat. I've got it down here, so I'm not remembering it. I'm not oh, that God, much of no, a fanboy. That's boy, like the Amazon so. title. The actual full title it was very simply... It was, uh, they, they, the publisher made us add Man 2.0, which I did not love, but it was, um, it's Engineering the Alpha, a real world guide to an unreal life. And then all the marketing shit was like, burn more fat, build more muscle, have more sex. But, you know, really that book was, um, Adam and I were really intending to, uh, sort of shake the fitness industry up and write a book that wasn't just about you know, uh, carbs and, and push-ups and all that. And uh, we, we were very, very lucky that it did so well. And uh, to this day, I, you know, just on Twitter today, I got someone mentioning that the book changed their life and had a couple questions about it. So it's nice. It's been five years. And, um, you know, it's not, we're not uh, the four-hour work week status. We're, you know, it's, it started an industry. But I'm very, very thankful that it's done as well as it has. It's, it's good to see as well because when we look at the fitness industry <laughs> back in 2012, and I was the ultimate bro back in 2012. I was still competing in bodybuilding compared to now. And you're seeing people that are coming in the industry actually still reading the book for the first time. So if it's able to influence them with the new generation, it's kind of cool to have that longevity in there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly better than, you know, um, fading into obscurity. But, you know, like anything else, that book is somewhat subject to... You know, the 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 built-in obsolescence of time in yeah. that, you know, so many of the things that, that I put in there are, like, things that I think are important for that program. Uh, but taken out of context, I don't think they're that important overall. Like, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of intermittent fasting, and that is one of the primary nutritional strategies of that book. Yep. Whereas, you know, like, I... If you don't want to do it, don't fucking do it. It's you know, it's, yeah. just like, it's amazing what gets taken out of context. And, and there's also other things in there that you know you think are really, really important at the time. 
you know, later, you're like, all right, it's probably not that big of a deal. Um, all, all that kind of shit. So but, if you were to re-release the book, mm-hmm. what would be the one thing you would change or add into it? You know, I'm going to, I'm going to dial back a little bit okay. <clears throat> because it was the first traditionally published book I'd ever written. And like the first time you do anything, you learn lessons. And one of those lessons I learned was that you are writing a book, but a publisher is releasing the book and they have a lot of say. And so you wind up in a lot of battles with the publisher, even though ultimately you guys want the same thing. And so part of that is um, learning how to pick your battles. And there are many, many things in the book that I fought very, very hard for. Um, Excuse me. Which would have necessitated that I I, I, I forfeit other battles. So, for example, I was very, very... And keep in mind, this five years ago. I was very, very... um, adamant that my voice not be edited very much and so when we really when we, when we turned the book into to harper collins and they read it they're like man you got a lot of f-bombs in this book we should probably take it down a notch and i was like no nah, man fuck that that's how i talk right I, you know and so and at the time that seemed like very you know uh, like noble artistic integrity and the thing about it is, they've published millions of books. I have published one. And I feel like I, although I, I'm very married to the idea of authenticity, I don't think that the book would have been harmed if I had allowed them to reduce the number of times we said fuck by like 30 or 40%. I wouldn't have taken it out completely, but it's an area where I would have been willing to give the publisher a little more latitude so that in other areas like like you know we turned in like a 370 page book and they published a 280 page book wow. and so they took all these things out and like one of them was like the warm up they just took warming up out and for whatever reason at the time I was like yeah people know they need to warm up it's fine just assume but then you know like the number of emails I've gotten from people who be like hey man what should I do for a warm up I'm like you know what I should have kept the warm up and dropped a couple of the F bombs, and then I would have made everyone happy. But, so you learn a lot of things, and and so while there's probably nothing in there that I fundamentally disagree with in terms of fitness, um, you know, there's there's just like the way the book is written. I might have might have been a little different. Yeah, and I think in the entrepreneurial world, you've worked with Gary V, and then moved him yep. on to Mike, and then it's gone on to Jordan as well. But yep. on the book. With the forward being from the man himself, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Tell the listeners the story, just how that came about, and then we'll go on to some of the other things we said we'd talk about. Sure. Okay. So, um, Arnold. Yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, of whom I assume most people have heard. I'd hope so. If not, why are they listening to... Is, yeah, they yeah why just, doesn't yeah. this? So, Ar- Arnold... Um, the internet is as small as it is big, and you never know who is listening. And there was a, a point at which I was doing a lot of Q&As on Facebook and everything. And one day I got an email from this guy named Dan, and he said, Hey, I know you do all these Q&As on Facebook, but I have kind of a public job, and I don't really want people knowing my business. Is it okay if I shoot you a couple of questions? Sure, all right, whatever. So we had a back and forth through email. And then... Uh, one day in a moment of like just complete idle curiosity, I Googled his name, and his name is Daniel Ketchell. And if you Google his name, what comes up are two things. The first is his Twitter, and the second is the Wikipedia page for the term body man. Now, a body man is a, it's a political term for a, a politician's like closest personal aide. It's like the guy who is always with him. He's like literally yep. almost always touching his body. And... Under notable body men was listed Daniel Ketchell, special assistant to Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I was like, oh, all right, well, this guy's going to get some more attention. <laughs> so we start building the relationship a little more. He signs up for my, my online coaching program. So now I'm, I'm, I'm working with this, this guy, and he's really great. And he's a great client. I'm training his, uh, his fiance as well. And, uh, but he's, you know, his job is to sort of travel with Arnold. And so 
you know, there are times, there's this one time in particular, and I want to say they were in, like, I want, maybe Brussels or, or, um, or Vienna. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he would, he had all these workouts that I wrote him and the nutrition and everything, and he's, um, <clears throat> he's training in a hotel gym or whatever. And he, Arnold would occasionally just, like, jump in and do these workouts with him, which is crazy, because, like, Arnold is now doing workouts that I wrote, and I'm like, that's fucking nuts. And so, at some point, he emails me, and he always, he never referred to Arnold as Arnold, he just, like, would always refer to him as, quote, the boss, and always with a capital B. And so, he, he does this workout, and it's, you know, it's a chest workout, and he emails me, and he's like, hey, the, um, the boss wants to know why we're doing squeeze presses instead of dumbbell flies for the chest. And so now I've got to write this email justifying my exercise selection for chest exercises to the man who has arguably some of the greatest chest development in the history of chests. And, you know, so now i got to, like, write this email for, for Daniel to, like, read to Arnold. And, be like, and so, I, you know, I explained it and explained the, the mechanics of it. And so he got back and he's like, yeah, yeah, he thought it was great. He really loved it. So thank you for this. <laughs> <laughs> and so then from there Arnold got out of office and he wanted to get back into fitness and he launched the uh, the fitness advisory board for his site Schwarzenegger.com and uh, you know so I, I, I had built a relationship with Dan and a little bit with Arnold and so that just sort of was natural and then when it was time to get a big name to write the foreword um, it's really like well who do we ask and there were only, only two people I'm so sorry, man. <laughs> Yo, okay. Fuck it. I've been up. So I've been up since 4 a.m. this morning. So, um, which is what happens when you just randomly have a dog who's like, nope, it's time to get up. Our dogs jump uh, on a bed at about that time, so it's, yeah, it's the it's same way. Yeah, it's time to walk. And yep. like, normally, I go back to bed for an hour, but today I didn't. <clears throat> but anyway, so when it was time to um, get someone to write the foreword. We wanted someone whose name would have a lot of impact and who would sell more copies and make the book better. And there were only two people we could think of. We're like, all right, it's either Arnold Schwarzenegger or Tim Ferriss. Now Tim is it's a friend of mine, great friend. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Tim for a favor down the line. Right now we're gonna ask Arnold. So we got Arnold to do it. And then when it was came to release the book, we we had a blog post on Tim's site, and uh, and that also did very well. So we, we were very lucky. Very, very I'm very very fortunate in my network. That is cool. And you've you've that network up even more since then and it just shows the quality of the work going out thank you the modern man we've got man 2.0 now we're five years later and the term male or masculine seems to get thrown around so much nowadays what yeah. does the modern man actually look like nowadays to you i mean i think that the the main thing is if you look at like what people thought of as a man in the 20s and the 50s and the 70s and now, it's all different. But one thing is pretty much in common, right? And um, I forget whose quote this is. Um, oh, God, I should Google it because it's really good. But it's basically, um, a man is a success if he wakes up in the morning and goes to bed at night and in between does what he wants. Um yeah, that's, so, that's good. But that's my definition of, of manhood, or, or really of success for any person, right? So um, it's important to note that, like, I'm um, a pretty vocal um, equalitarian. I'm very vocal yeah. in my uh, my fight for LGBTQ rights and women's rights, reproductive rights. I'm, you know, I, I identify very strongly as a feminist. And for, for people who don't, like, understand feminism, when a guy says he's a feminist, it basically just believes he thinks women it basically means he believes women are people and not objects yeah uh, and like i believe people should get paid the same for the same work so i gotta I, you know if you guys are if you guys are like anti-feminism please don't fucking email me i'm like i'm not interested but anyway all of that to say is that like i because of that because of my deep dive into identity politics and feminism i'm always hesitant to say like a man is this what i believe is I'm not particularly interested in masculinity. I am interested in cultivating capability. I believe that all people should strive for a Darwinian type of fitness. So fitness not meaning being strong or lean or whatever. Fitness meaning suitability for success in the environment that you find yourself in. And, um, you know, there's all this weird stuff about, like, oh, well, every man should know how to change a tire. 
And I feel like anyone who fucking drives a car should know how to change a tire. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you have a dick or not. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, but there's all this old stuff that, like, people associate with, with women, right? That is weird. And I think, you know, like, I, I, it's weird because, like, cooking and sewing and cleaning, these are things that I learned in the Boy Scouts and my friends learned in the military. And I, <clears throat> I don't know how those wound up being considered feminine and how changing a tire got to be considered masculine. So <clears throat> what I think is this. I think everyone, man or woman, but in this case we'll talk about men, it should be about determining the things that are important to you and pursuing them um, regardless of what anyone else thinks. And I know, you know, like look at Matt Kroc, um, you know, famous powerlifter who – lived his entire life as Matt, and now she lives her life as Janae <clears throat> because she was trans, is trans, and now identifies more as fluid, but, you know, here's this person who spent their entire life, was it was a, it was a Navy SEAL or Marine, served in the military, got huge, has a, has a back exercise named after him, and really was masquerading as something that they aren't, and, and instead wants to wear makeup and, and wigs and, and look beautiful. And I think that <clears throat> I would hesitate to say that makes Janae more manly than most people because I don't want to equate being a badass with being a man because I think there are tons of yeah. badass women in the world. What I think it makes Janae is a really capable, st smart, strong, amazing person. Whether Janae is identifying as fluid or as gender fluid or as gender non-binary or a man or a woman is irrelevant. So I, I really think that, you know, gender roles are, are important to an extent. But ultimately, like, my definition of a man is someone who, A, happens to personally identify as a man and also goes out of their way to be good at shit and good, at, good to the people in their life. And I, I don't really think that... Um, we have to stress all these differences between what makes a man and a woman. Instead, I think we should, like, look at what makes a good person. And that means, you know, being true to your word, doing the things that you say you're going to do, actively seeking to improve yourself, um, taking care of your body and your mind and, and your heart, uh, doing the things that fulfill you and and make you better so that you can best serve the world and if you identify as a man and you know part of that means wearing dresses fucking awesome wear the fucking nicest dress you can find i don't you know i think that's great if you like wearing sick ass suits do that if you're kind of like just want to wear hoodies and jeans do that just whatever you wear wear it well and i don't think that uh, that should be determined by your gender or your gender identification and i think that um you know, while while I I do not uh, identify as like a leftist, uh, an extreme leftist who thinks that like gender is stupid. I, I, think, I think instead I just think that like you know I, I the, it's not affecting me, uh, and I, I just I yeah. So my definition of a man is someone who themselves identifies as a man and um, who actively strives to do good work. That is an amazing answer with that, definitely. Uh, let's look deeper into some of the things that we, we touched on in the book specifically for the male uh, when sure. it comes to nowadays compared to 20 30 years ago there's sure. a few people um i can't remember who it was someone on instagram was saying uh, it might have been eric cressy i can't remember some someone was saying about uh, testosterone levels how different they are and even before like in bodybuilding that the, the yep. pre anabolic area area era when people like reg park before anabolics were big and people were saying yes they were still using loads and everything back then but the society that the world we live in seems to be just set out for mm -hmm. testosterone levels to be lower yeah i mean that's the crazy thing and it's not like it's not like society is, is like launching a war against testosterone. It's that society is giving us all these options to do things, and in doing them, we're lowering our own testosterone yeah. levels, right? So, like, 20 years ago, none of us were staying up on our phones, like, scrolling through Instagram until fucking, like, 2 in the morning. 
But if you do that, and you if you if you should be going to bed at eleven, and you're staying up until two on Instagram, <clears throat> you're getting three fewer hours of sleep per night. And studies have shown that if you sleep six hours per night or less for as little as two weeks, you're dropping testosterone levels by like fifteen percent. So after the age of thirty, testosterone levels drop in males. It, from your whatever your baseline is, they drop about 1% per year. So 10% per decade. And so if you stay up on Instagram for two weeks, getting six hours per night or less for, two, for as little as two weeks, you've dropped your testosterone 15%. And so that's like aging 15 years in two weeks. That's crazy. Hormonally speaking... Because you stay up on Instagram. So when we talk about like society being against, you know, testosterone, it's not like there's some fucking cult out there who's being like, no, being macho is Just bad. Sucking the testosterone out. Bad. Everyone has to be okay with, you know, wearing dress. Like, I, no, it's just physiologically, we're doing shit that's really fucking bad for us. Yeah. And, you know, it's the foods we eat, it's the type of, um, it's, it's really the type of, uh, lifestyle we have and thankfully people are generally more dedicated to exercise like the lay person is dedicated more dedicated to exercise than they were in the 60s and 70s and 80s um, but at the same time our diet is far worse like if you look at people in the 50s and 60s 40s 50s 60s most people were pretty thin mm -hmm. um, and they like we were like a generally like pretty physically fit nation in the states anyway, uh, but it, nobody was like going to gyms and getting jacked. It wasn't really a thing, which is why you know bodybuilders like Arnold stood out so much in the seventies, right? Because it's like these people are like absolutely mind blowingly different than the average human. Now, I mean, Arnold wouldn't crack the top twenty at a local show, yeah, you know, with, with his with his like early physique. And, um, because we all do that. So, um, you know, what I think is that there are so many changes that have happened and we've been very, very positive in the general sense, pushing exercise forward and physical fitness forward. But, uh, you know, dietarily we've become very fractured. Um, there's all these crazy extreme diet, you know, paleo and vegan and everything else. Whereas, you know, in the forties, you know, people are just like, hey, man, war's over. We're just yeah. so glad we have fucking food. <laughs> exactly. And I think as well, like when you look at um, the, the genetics when it's come through with people that have actually suffered through the war and mm -hmm. then they've had children when they've been in a starvation mode or even people when uh, I'm, I'm reading Man's Search for Meaning at the moment, uh, amazing book, and you think mm -hmm. about... The, the Jews that are in the concentration camp that survived this then mm -hmm. had children and all the nutrient deficiencies and they're going to be picked up now as well. And you think yeah. those people were so thankful just to have food and now yeah. all the convenience we've got now, people's appreciation has just gone down, I feel. Yeah, I mean, like, on the one hand, it's like... It, on the one hand, like, if you look at the paleo diet or, or veganism, which yep. are two diametrically opposed diets, right? On the one hand, I appreciate that there is this sort of push toward, hey guys, we've gotten kind of nuts with the fucking snack foods and all these other things. Let's move more towards what we would consider like a natural way of eating. With paleo people, it's more like these. let's eat the foods that existed before modern agriculture. And with vegans, it's more like let's just follow the Michael Pollan of like eat food, not too much, mostly plants kind of thing. And both of those are good at their heart, right? Yep. And but and they blame these generations of 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s of mass producing this this food that is, is was like void of a lot of nutrition. And like, okay, yeah, that's true, but we didn't know better, firstly. Uh, but the other thing is, it's like, God damn, can you imagine being alive in 1950 after having just gone through World War II and being like, Fuck yes, Twinkies, America. This is the representation of everything we fought for. The <laughs> fucking Twinkie. Because now nobody's starving. Yeah. And it's like, the problem with food is that it's not just food. It's not just stuff that we eat. 
It's not just something that we do for energy. <clears throat> Nobody ever says, hey, do you want to go out for food? Nobody says food. People say, hey, do you want to go out for Italian? Do you want to go out for Japanese? Do you want to go out for sushi? Do you want to go out for, for Indian food? And so what that means is that the very first thing that a culture, an entire people and society puts out in the world to represent itself to other societies is food that's meant to be consumed. And so it's a very slippery slope to start talking about food is good or bad. It's like this cultural experience. Like if you come to New York and you didn't have a slice of pizza. Oh, uh, it was good. You didn't come to fucking New York. I'm sorry. It's like if I go to, if I go to Sydney, like I want to go see the fucking opera house. I don't give a shit. I don't fucking care about that building. I could see a picture of it right now. When I go to Sydney, when I go to Australia, I want some local to take me around and be like, no, this, these are the fucking meat pies we eat, and only locals know about this shit. That's what I want. You know, so it's culture. It's the way that we absorb other cultures. And, like, on the one hand, like, yes, saying no, these things, like, doing these things in excess is bad, totally. But on the other hand, it is the most ridiculous level of, like, modern luxury to be able to look at 90% of the food that's available in the world, like, nope, that's not for me. I'm only going to eat vegan-friendly shit at a vegan... Like, that is the most insanely narcissistic, unbelievably spoiled thing in the world. To just be like, oh, 90% of the food available? Nope, not going to eat it. Not for me. No, uh-uh. It is crazy. When, when you look at it and put it into perspective like that, it is absolutely nuts. And... The, the pizza in, in New York, that, that was amazing. Two Boots yeah, we man. went to, that was good. Oh, Two Boots is great. Oh, great. Dad, so, I'm so glad you went to Two Boots. That's yeah, great. we had one of, one of my friends from Brooklyn came over and he's like, oh, wow. right, me, me and my wife were going to go to pizza. He said, no, don't go there. We'll walk to Hell's yes. Kitchen, I think. And it's like, Two Boots, amazing. Yeah. And the that's portion size as well. You're right near my place. I live in Hell's Kitchen. That's so funny. Oh. Two Boots is, uh, let me see, we're on 38th and 10th. So Two Boots is one avenue and five blocks away. So it was so good. It. it was definitely so good. Uh, yeah. So when it comes to that, I mean, people just need to take a bit more responsibility, I feel, when it comes to what works for them. I've just done a video on it, actually, and talking about how I actually fell into some of the pitfalls of certain nutrition was I was trying to put myself in a box. Mm -hmm. And it was... Uh, it, it wasn't necessarily keto, but like you've got keto, you've got the paleo, you've got intermittent fasting, as you mentioned, you've got so many different ways of doing it, but people pick what's marketed to them rather than what works for them. Right. And I find that take the best things out of each one and just find your own way. Exactly. But here's the thing, like, you know, you and I have spoken before <clears throat> and we talked about how um, for me uh, when I was younger and for you as well, you kind of like when you first get into it, you go crazy. You go a little bit nuts yep. and you live at the absolute edge of the extreme. And like, no, I don't eat this food. No, I'm going to weigh every morsel and all of this. Sh and that's great. And it's really fine because I believe that life is like a pendulum, right? And, you you know, if you start here, like not caring at all about your food, you know, and you just eat whatever's in front of you when you're a kid, like I you did, fucking yep. eat Wendy's and McDonald's and whatever. And then you turn into a bodybuilder, and now you're over here all the way on the other side. You go a little crazy. And that's that's normal. And then the pendulum swings back, and you wind up sort of in the middle, hopefully a little more toward the healthy side, where you're being cognizant. And I do think that for fitness in particular and for business, that trial by fire is absolutely necessary. It is this thing that teaches you about yourself and allows you to develop skill sets like discipline and tracking and... Uh, and, and, and I think that like self-denial is a really good skill. I think that it, you know, self-control and, um, you know, it's dangerous because it, for a lot of people, it can result in an eating disorder. It did for me at the time. Yeah, definitely. me too. I, you know, I was definitely like orthorexic and I was just like, no, I don't eat that food. That's bad. And then eventually, hopefully you get over it and you get to a, a place of moderation where, you know, I, we, I remember we talked about this in terms of, like, you couldn't go on dates because... Yeah, know, I took chicken not... and broccoli into the cinema on a first date, which didn't lead to a second one. It's, why the hell would I do that now? Like, right. Like, think yeah. about that. Like, imagine if someone just told you, like, hey, dude, listen, you can eat the chicken and broccoli. Just eat it before you go on the date. Yeah. Just, like, don't eat it in front of her, you fucking psycho. No, it's 20 minutes early. <laughs> nope. Like, no, can't. It's got to... I have to be on that time. If not, I lose my gains. 
Right. Is That's absolutely bad. crazy. I, I don't want to go catabolic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's that post, so, post-workout exercise window in it or food window and everything. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, but I, I think that that stuff, you know, we're, we're at the point now, we're a little older, we can, like, look back and laugh. And my goal is always to tell people that that's not necessary, but also not to shame them for going through it. If you are a young guy or young woman or however you identify and you're going through that phase right now where, like, the way that you eat <clears throat> is the most important thing in your life and it is the lens through which you sort of look at everything and you process all decisions but based on how it's going to affect your nutrition, I want to tell you you don't need to do that. You absolutely don't need to do that, people. But if you're currently in that phase of your life and you're doing it, get everything you can out of it. Learn from it. Don't just make it about the food. Make it about the lessons that you learn from organizing your life, from prioritizing something to the extent that it determines how and when and where you eat, sleep, and go to the bathroom is a really valuable thing in your life. Because here's the thing. You know, it's crazy to me that, like, I don't understand how people do this for a long time and then forget to learn the lesson. Because I know tons of people who won't cheat on their fucking diets, but they cheat on their boyfriend. Yeah. And, like, that's crazy. Because you didn't learn. You didn't learn from it. If you had learned, if you had taken that skill, if you had understood that, you know, this rigid dieting wasn't just helping you get abs, that it was building discipline and teaching you about the things that were important to you then maybe 10 years from now you'd be in a position where it's easier to walk away from that guy or where you realize what you want and you're like, you can have a conversation with someone and be like, hey, listen, I think you're great. I'm not interested in monogamy right now or whatever else. And this is the kind of shit that happens. And it takes a while to get there. But I will say that the lessons that I learned through fitness and through nutrition and through business eventually taught me a lot of personal lessons that led to where I am now. And, and it's crazy to say that like learning dietary moderation in some way made me more successful in my, uh, my life to the point where like now my romantic relationships are set up in a, in a different way. Like I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm polyamorous. I live with my two girlfriends. Um, and it, it's, you know, it's very different than what most people do, but like I was only able to get there by, by actively learning all of the lessons from everything I was doing and not just being like, well, these fitness lessons are only applicable to fitness. I think that's a big thing with anything we go through in life. I mentioned to you what happened when, when I was 15 with, with my dad and I learned from that. And it was a lesson of that's brought me to where I am today. The bodybuilding with going through eating disorders, that's made me the coach I am today. And it's looking back on these things and taking the lesson out of everything which we can develop and actually move forward to actually become a better person. Right. And you put that on your Instagram the other day about when you were in your 20s and you kind of put deposits into your bank of yes. fitness. How? Yeah. Like, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so... I have a great friend, a guy named David Delanave, uh, who's a world uh, record-holding powerlifter. He, he owns a record in the, the Jefferson deadlift. Really brilliant guy, um, super smart, <clears throat> and, and really just like has a good perspective on the world. And so David and I, in conversation, he had once said to me that he looks at fitness and finance very similarly in that if you like really prioritize investing when you're in your 20s, mm -hmm. you can coast later on. Like if you go balls to the wall in your 20s, like, you know, with your finances, like investing in your stock portfolio, by the time you get into like you're 35, like you, you're earning enough dividends that you could pretty much coast. Your things will just keep sort of moving. Same thing with fitness. Like I went balls to the wall from the time I was like 19 until I was probably, eh, probably actually like 18, 16 or 18, if, if you count high school, uh, all the way into... Um, you know, my late 20s, and now I'm, I'm 36, and my physique is pretty much defaults to, I'm 5'8", and I'm 194 pounds, and, like, I walk around, like, 12 to 15% body fat, like, 15 if I'm, like, really being lazy, if I'm, like, working reasonably hard, and, like, even not really paying tons of attention to trying to get lean or stay lean, 12% body fat, so I've got visible abs, I'm like, why does a bond born door? My fucking back is enormous. My calves are huge. My quads are terrible, but that's been my whole life. What <laughs> shorts are for? 
It's like, I mean, yeah, but I wear real short shorts, and it's like the worst part about having giant calves is that, like, it makes uh, my, my quads look even worse. It's like, usually ah. the other way around. <laughs> yeah, it is for most people. Um, but my point is that I invested a lot in my 20s, tons of time, thousands of hours. God only knows the total time under tension, but, I mean... You know, like the tri- like I built this really strong foundation, and now that's like my physiological default. That you know, so I, I put up this post about how I moved into a new apartment here here in this building that I'm in now, in um, uh, in April, April one, and then like furnishing the apartment and like moving both of my partners in, and uh, then I was I had like travel and it was my birthday and then it was my partner's birthday and then it was my best friend's birthday and then like the, we were out you know like. All of the, like, the month was just absolutely bonkers. Like, six weeks of insanity, plus running my mastermind, um, you know, doing all the new writing coaching shit. It was just, like, absolutely crazy. And to say that I didn't have time to train would be absolute fucking bullshit. Of course, there's a gym in the building. All I would have had to do is go down, get on the elevator, go downstairs, and fucking dedicate 20 to 30 minutes out of the day. I easily could have done that, but I didn't. I just wasn't prioritizing it, and that's fine. I'm okay with that. Yeah. But at the end of a six-week period where I trained exactly twice, maybe three times, and they were shitty training sessions. They weren't, like, fucking balls to the wall. You know, I, like, looked in the mirror, and I'm like, damn, I look fucking great. Like, do I look as good as I would look if I had dialed in my nutrition all six weeks and not skipped a workout? No. But... Like, the different... It's crazy. Like, Tim Tim Ferriss talks about this with, like, the 80-20 principle. And it's true. But, like, here's the thing, man. You When you get to a certain point, when you've built a certain baseline, you can get 95% of the results with 5% of the effort. And <clears throat> that's sort of where I was. That's what that post was about. It was about I've made enough investment. I had that trial by fire for a long enough period of time when I was a younger man that now <clears throat> I can coast. Can I do it forever? No. If I stop working out completely, things are going to, no. Like, that's that's crazy. But, you know, I did it for six or seven weeks, and now I'm, like, doing this little mini body transformation thing with a couple of my friends. Uh, Shout-outs just for fun. Uh, Eric Bach, Bob Thompson, Joey Persia, all great dudes in the fitness industry um, or, or the entrepreneurial industry. Mm-hmm. And we're doing this little challenge, and we're going to have a photo shoot at the end of the month. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, so... The point was that, like, if you invest a lot when you're younger, you can sort of coast later on, and that's uh, that's nice to know. Yeah, it's like you're putting that deposit in, and you can then just take withdrawals, yes, which is good. Exactly. Uh, you mentioned Joey there, who's in his copyright in the copywriting world now. He was, did you mentor him? I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Joey. Joey's a great friend of mine. Um, actually, a funny story about Joey Persia. If you guys don't know Joey, please check it out. Uh, Joey wrote a great, great book called Why Do You Hate... Oh, there it is. Why Do You Hate Money? A, um, a fitness marketer's guide to help... What, what, read the subtitle. By the way, I, like, I'm going to show you something. Pull it up. But uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something. Um, a fitness so, marketing fitness guide, guide to create to... content that kills, craft copy that converts, and master the science of selling without selling out. Um, and so... Let me see... Um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, let me see if I can, uh, so, <laughs> are you behind that title? So Joey and I, so I'll see if I can find it. Joey and I um, sat on my couch and uh, what is it? Copy that converts. Eh, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I'll see if I can find it uh, without selling it. I can't seem to find it. Oh, well. Anyway, so Joey and I um, sat on my couch here, and we, like, pulled apart, like, all the different things we wanted to do and eventually stitched together and came up with that subtitle. So, um, but yeah, Joey, uh, Joey and I met um, through Mike Vacanti, who was a protege of mine. Mike lived with Joey. And then Joey eventually joined my mastermind, and we, uh, you know, we, like, really tried pretty hard to figure out what he wanted to do in the fitness stuff, and then just like got involved in copywriting and fucking loved it. And he just is really, really great at that. And Joey got married. Um, it'll be a year soon. He got married on July 8th of 2017. And I actually officiated his wedding. So I, I performed the ceremony for he and his wife, Lauren, 
which is a you know wonderful thing Amazing, to be able to yeah. do. It's the, the third or fourth one I've done. And uh, yeah, so he's just a really, really great guy. So he's in the copywriting world now. He's fantastic. I recommend him very highly if you're looking for... Uh, get him now, by the way. If you're, if you're interested in hiring, and this goes to all of the people listening to this, if you are currently looking for a reasonably priced copywriter who is amazing, please hire Joey now because he's going to raise his... Like, he, he's not charging what he's worth, which is, you know, whatever. I mean, this is like, he'll figure it out. He'll figure out that he's worth 10 times as much. <laughs> but until he does, please hire him now and, and get him while it's, while it's reasonably inexpensive. Um, but yeah, he's great. Love that kid. So tell, tell us a little bit more about your writing, the coaching you do with writing. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I've always been a writer since I was eight years old. I mean, as, for, as long as I can remember. I told my mom when I was eight, I, I want to write a book. And when she asked why, I said, because, <laughs> because books make me happy and I want to make other people happy. And I just fell in love with writing. And it's always what I was doing when I was 14. I was writing for magazines like Scry. If you don't know Scry magazine, the reason you don't know it is because one, it's not around anymore. And two, you weren't a huge fur- fucking nerd. And so Scry magazine... I was a nerd, but I don't think it was here over here. Oh, probably not. Yeah, yeah. Not, not, not over there. So Scry was the type of magazine where you would read if you wanted to learn how to build a really sick Magic the Gathering deck. And so it was like a nerdy gaming magazine. I also wrote for Dungeon and Dragon Magazine. Um... So those are two different magazines. There's Dungeon Magazine and Dragon Magazine. And so I was oh, writing, sorry. like, nerdy, you know, like, science fiction fantasy short stories about fucking elves killing goblins and stuff. And that was when I was, like, 14 or 15, which is really cool. So, I'd write, you know, I'd write these stories. And some editor, like, didn't know I was 15, and they fucking paid me. <laughs> nice. Was great. And then, uh, you know, I got involved in the fitness stuff and started writing there. But I, I'm very, very fortunate in that I am uh, – I went to an Ivy League school – here in the States, and I studied writing, and it, it's something that's always been um, a passion for me. And, and writing is really cool because the more you read, the better you get at writing, and the more you write, the better you get at writing. So the more you do it, you can just like keep in, improving. And so that happens sort of um, unintentionally. But if you're intentional about it, if you actively read books on writing and actively try to improve the craft, then you can get a lot better really quickly. And I was very, very fortunate in that this skill set served me so well. When I came into the online fitness space, it didn't matter that my content was like B plus. My writing was A plus, and everyone was reading my shit. And um, and by the way, I like I hope that people listening understand that I'm I'm saying these things without ego. Like I, uh, my writing is something that I work on, and it's something that I both love and sure, loathe passion. by turns and in equal measure. But in the case of the fitness industry, like, I'm certainly, in an absolute sense, I'm no Hemingway. But compared to the average person in the fitness industry, I was was a standout. And so what this allowed me to do was really um, get published in a lot of places and make a big impact and really build my my following and my business. And uh, people just kept asking for resources and how do I get better and what, you know. And so... I was doing a lot of business coaching in, in my mastermind, the, uh, the Wellspring Society, and um, it got to the point where so much of what I was doing with some of these people was focusing specifically on writing. And then a couple of people started asking for um, one-on-one coaching, and I, I was hesitant to do it for a while, and instead I started doing writing workshops where I'd put everyone in a house for three days and go over their big projects, etc. But um, eventually, I started doing the one-on-one stuff, which is which is amazing because the way that we do it is I give people assignments and then I grade them and then we go over them uh, on a Skype call, just like this, where I, I actively edit things line by line and explain to them why I'm making the changes they make. And it's not just me being like, "All right, well, this is how I would have written it. It's better." It's I'll give them three options and like i'll take a paragraph and i'll I'll help them rewrite it three different ways and i'll help them decide which one fits their voice because the goal for me as a teacher as a writing coach is not to help people sound like me it's to help them sound like the best version of them you know and that's it's it's amazing to see people come alive and, and all of the different ways they learn how to say things and and i'm so passionate about writing english is such an amazing language. Like, I, I like to joke, like, I, you know, I know that um, a, a lot of my friends who are European, 
they speak four or five languages, you know? And, uh, and I wish that I could. I don't. I only speak one. But I always joke with people that the reason that I don't speak other languages is not because I'm not good at language. It's because I've dedicated all of my resources to getting really good at English, and I hope to get there one day. <laughs> um, but English is so multifaceted and mellifluous and, and brilliant and beautiful, and it's got such amazing mouthfeel. You know, it's, English is one of the few languages, and there really aren't a lot, where... If you wanted to say something was big, you've got like 15, 20, 25 ways to do that. It can be big or great or grand or large or huge or gigantic or enormous or tremendous or titanic or like you can, you have all Endless, of these yeah. different words. And you know, if it's small, it can be small or tiny or teeny or minuscule or, or diminutive. And you know, and, and it's it, it learning these words and the exact way to use them in the, in the, you know, Mark Twain has his brilliant quote that I love, and he said, the difference between the right word and the nearly right word is the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. And that is really what I focus on when I'm teaching people how to write. First, I want them to sound unadulteratedly like them. I want them to be able to just really get the truth, the deepest truth out of them and write it in a way that only they can do it. And part of that is giving them these tool sets that allow them to know what the exact right word is instead of the nearly right word. And and that's it's this brilliant thing that I do. I love it. It's it's the most satisfying thing. And it's crazy because it's so fucking time consuming and it's not even remotely scalable. But uh, you know, it's like you're getting on the phone with someone for an hour and spending that time like going over two to five paragraphs sometimes and that's it. And but, you know, like it's crazy that watching helping someone go over two paragraphs of their own writing that the next time they submit something all five pages are so much better and it's really insane and i love it it's amazing when you say that and it's kind of uh, an awakening when you realize what you're doing is something you're so passionate about yes and you've developed a life to actually be able to do that so when you say it's not scalable you've put in the <laughs> groundwork to make sure you don't actually need it to be scalable to sure. be able to do it and to survive so this really cool to be able to see that you're still doing that and not just focusing on the dollars yeah i mean you know the great thing about it is and this is what i teach in, in the wellspring society <clears throat> the wellspring society my business coaching mastermind um i want everyone to make money man i want everyone to make a lot of money money's great yep it's cool it you know money like people say like money doesn't buy happiness like no money does not buy happiness but what it does is it allows you the freedom to figure out the shit that makes you happy. Yep, definitely. <laughs> you, it's like, if you, you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like, food, shelter, water, or the base of that pyramid. If, like, you don't have that shit sorted, you can't work your way up to self-actualization. You can't. You're too busy surviving. And so, once you get the money shit sorted, and, like, you're like, oh, I can, yeah, great, I live in a nice place, I got a fucking picture of Beyonce in the background. <laughs> like, now you can really focus on what makes you happy. And so, yeah, I don't think money buys happiness, but money buys the opportunity to seek happiness. And that is what people miss a lot. And one of the things I teach in my business mastermind is getting to this moment of apotheosis. And that, that is a, a term that comes from uh, the Greek. It means to become godlike. It's, it's very, uh, it, it dovetails with the hero's journey, which we, we've talked about a little bit. Um, and apotheosis is a moment of ultimate realization where you become this, like, you know, almost godlike in your ability to see things a different way. And I want everyone to keep making enough money to get there. Because for me, what happened was uh, 2011, I realized that if my income doubled, like literally I was just making twice as much money tomorrow as I was today, my life would not change. I would have lived in the same place. I'd drive the same car, I'd have the same friends, I'd do the same things, I'd eat the same shit at the same restaurants. Um, I mean, if my income, like, went up 10x, then, yeah, okay, like, maybe now I buy a fucking yacht or a plane or something. I don't know. I don't, but, like, now I got to be in the plane business, and I got to pay for the tarmac, and fuel is expensive. I don't want to own a plane. But my point is that if my money, if my income had doubled, nothing would change. And that is a very freeing experience because money now doesn't matter as much. You don't have to make decisions about money. You get to make decisions instead of money. Like, making money is cool, making decisions is better. And a lot of times people don't realize you're making, you're letting your money make decisions for you. And so instead, um, 
I just got to really focus on what I wanted to do. And at that point, it was focusing on writing the book. And that's what I try to do. I try to get everyone in the society to the exact point where money just sort of doesn't matter. I mean, it always matters. You know, money mm-hmm. always matters. But it, um, you know, where it's like if it doubled, nothing would change. And then it becomes sort of what happens is when people, a lot of people get to that point and they don't realize it. And then money just becomes this weird scorekeeping mechanism. And it's just like, okay, well, I, I made 20000 last month. I, now I have to make 21000 this month. Why? Why are you going to spend so much extra effort trying to make another 1000 bucks or whatever it is um, when that's not going to improve your life? Like, why don't you stop trying to keep score? Why don't, like, your, your income doesn't need to go up every month just because that's the way you measure business growth. You can grow your business in other ways. You can deepen your relationship with your customers and your readers. You can sort of take a step back and let it, you know, like just like your body and, and your finances. I've invested shit to the point where, like, I can sort of step back and I can just fuck around on social media for a couple of weeks and my income doesn't go down. And that's really cool. And and just, yeah. like, talk about the shit that I want and I love. And so that's what I do in the business mastermind. I really, in the, the Wellspring Society, the name comes from one of my favorite quotes by Miguel de Montaigne, and it is obsession is the wellspring of both genius and madness. Wow. And I, I, which is a quote I truly love, and I think it's absolutely true. And so, you know, I think that in order to make your business really, really successful, you do kind of have to be a genius. You got to be a little bit fucking crazy. Yep. And you definitely have to be obsessed for a while. But pinging back and forth between those places that's the beauty of life, right? It's not being all crazy all the time. It's not being a genius all the time. It's not being completely obsessed. But when you do that, you know, you're able to focus on the things that drive you real, real intense happiness. And that is what I want those people in my group to find. So when I mentor people, it's about, okay, how can we make a lot of money for you? But on the way there, how can we figure out what you want to be doing with that money? Because you don't just want to like come in and be like, I want to build a huge coaching business. And like people do that and they start with the end in mind. Like, okay, I want to make $50,000 a month, right? Well, if I charge, um, I don't know, like 500 for my 500 a month for coaching, like yeah. how many clients do you need? It's still, that's a lot of fucking people. Yeah. People, you know, and you like, you don't necessarily want to do that. Now, if you are only charging 250, now you got to coach 200 people. Like, do you really want to be coaching 200 people? Do you want to be answering 200 people's emails and questions about fasting and shit? That's hard. But, you know, people are so focused on that end number, like I want to make 50,000 or 20,000 or whatever it is, that when they get there, they realize they've built themselves this gilded cage. They're now trapped by this business that they built that they might not want. And so for me... What I do with my mentoring and what I do in the society and what we do, my, my, my group and I, I just want everyone to be aware and, and to like not ever miss the forest for the trees and to not get so focused on the money that they forget to like to look at. And there's, you know, there's an old quote. It's like, don't ever, you know, don't ever become so busy making a living that you forget to make a life. A lot of people do that. You know, that's the trap. Yeah. And I help people avoid that. It's massively true. Have you found the other, the rest of the people? Have you filled all the other spaces that we spoke about? Because um, I'm obviously coming under your wing with yeah. some mentorship that sure. is going to be pretty cool to look at. Have you found the rest of the people yet? We've so I so just to create context for everyone. So within the context of the Wellspring Society, uh, which is the the mastermind, um, you know, it's like there's. Uh, it, it's it, I you know the value is there for everyone. It's a it's a it's a nice great business coaching group. Everybody makes money. We talk about copywriting and product ideation and and coaching and all the other stuff. <clears throat> but I wanted to work with a couple of people at a slightly higher level and really get into more like looking at their business, like the life coaching. What makes you happy? How can we you know do all this other stuff? And so uh, so Ollie's coming on board and um, a guy named Matt McLeod is coming on board and we have. One more person, actually one of the guys who's already in, in the mastermind, a guy named Marty McPhee, has sort of come on board. And so I'm speaking to a few more people, so I have two spots open because I, I'm working, basically it's like the mastermind itself, the society, I can accommodate up to 40 people. But for this sort of higher level thing, the cadre, I want to work with five, maybe six. And so what we're going to do 
is like if we have a, a society meeting and it's two days long, I want all of you guys to come in a day early and we're gonna like really get deep and like we'll be extra speak and just like really work on like the fucking deep shit that like is about life and just like okay great if we added another ten thousand dollars to your monthly income now what are you gonna do with it how does it change your life are you happier like do you know because we could i could teach you guys you know i could teach people a million ways to make a million dollars this year but like god then you gotta keep doing like it, it's like you i respect the hell out of anyone who starts a podcast because, and I joke all the time about not starting podcasts on Facebook, but the reason I don't want to do it is because, like, man, now I got to do a podcast. Now I got homework to do every week, and I respect the shit out of anyone who looks at that. Like, no, I love interviewing people. I love talking to people enough that spending this, spending it two hours out of my week every week doing it, and then another three hours editing it, that brings you joy. That's fucking brilliant. I love that. What I want though is for people who love this to do this and I also feel a great great responsibility to help people avoid doing it because if people are starting podcasts because everyone else has a podcast that's yep. the exact wrong reason to do it and if you don't like know what you're doing you're not going to make money and you're going to start it and you're going to waste a lot of time and then you'll stop after 15 episodes and no one will listen to it and you just look like an asshole and so you know society is all about like helping people figuring out what they want to do and avoid the shit they don't want to do I think, yeah, a lot of people fall into the traps and, as you say, with podcasts or starting a vlog and all these things because other people have done it. And before they know it, they're really resenting it. And yeah. they're, they're then gone into what would have been better just to do a nine to five job. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. A, I mean, a lot more. Because at, yeah. at least you get to turn your brain off at the end of the day. Is that, I was speaking to that today, actually. I was sorting uh, my phone out. Um, I had some issues with that, which... That's another story. But in, in the store there, and he was saying, what do you do? And I, I coach people, get to go around the world, which is really cool. And I told him when I was in the corporate world, I said it was just, it was actually easy in a way back then because you could walk out of the doors and just switch off. Now yeah. it's your business and you can switch off, but you have to be aware of it. Yeah, it's really difficult. It's, you got to like actively switch off, dude. It's, you know, because here's the thing. We're in this place where everything is business, right? Like, yeah. All these things that other people, that regular people do for fun is part of your business. So, like, I, I, if I'm if I'm going to a movie and I'm standing in line, like, waiting to get, like, well, I don't, I don't eat popcorn in a movie, but I get milk. I like milk does. I don't know why. What are they? It's not for, it's, it's like, honestly, it's like a ball of, of, of caramel covered in milk chocolate. And it's just, like, it gets stuck in your teeth and it's gooey and it's not even that good. But I always get it at the movies. It's the, I would never get it anywhere else. It yeah. just makes me feel like I'm at the movies. It's a weird... Oh, yeah. I got popcorn over there, and I didn't realize that the American portion sizes are American portion sizes. Oh, yes, it was yes. like the size of my head. It's yes. great. <laughs> what do you feel about that popcorn? So, but if I'm standing in line waiting to order my milk duds and my, my soda or whatever else, and I take out my phone and I open Instagram, now I'm working. Because yep. Instagram is work. Instagram is content. And now I open Instagram and I look around, and I'm like, oh my god, maybe, or if I'm you, if I'm Ollie, I'm like, okay, great. I'm going to take a picture of this fucking American popcorn pocket next to my head to show this is crazy. Americans eat so much or whatever it is. You can turn that into content. You yeah. Know? And Even like dog pictures. Super... Right. Dog pictures. Are kind of my... Yeah. I, like, I started an Instagram just for my dog. Guys, by the way, if you're, if you can only follow one Instagram account, please don't like, listen. My Instagram is at John Romanello, but my dog is at Lisey Bear. L E E S I. B E A R. Lisey Bear. Her name is Khaleesi, like from Game of Thrones. She's half Boston Terrier, half English Bulldog. She's the love of my life. And I started, I, after five years, I finally started an Instagram for her, right? Um, how many followers at the moment? Oh, that's a great question. Let's find, let's see how many followers Lisey has. Um, Lisey has. Uh, 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 Lisey Bear has nine posts and 98 followers. So that's not bad. That's not bad. There's 99 um, now. Let's, let's get 100. Oh, snap. Let's get to okay. the 100th. What, what does the 100th follower get? A signed picture uh, from, from Lisi. Yeah, <laughs> Lisi will put her paw in. <laughs> but, uh, so my point is that, like, taking pictures of my dog is now work yeah. in some way. And the reason I started an account for my dog, and this is actually a really great tip. Um, if, if people are listening to this podcast <clears throat> for some insight about uh, how to build businesses, this is a really good tip that I want to give you, and I'm not actually joking when I say that um, that my dog has helped my business. Here's the thing. 
I realized that a big part of my lack of Instagram growth was that I didn't post regularly, mm -hmm. right? You got to post regularly to grow Instagram. But a big part of the reason that I don't post regularly is because I'm not really a visual person. I'm a, I'm a writer. I'm a text-based person. And I can write you the greatest caption in the world, but uh, I need a picture to go with it. And so when I looked through my phone, and like one day I was scrolling through and seeing like what, what old picture can I post and then write a caption about so that I have content for Instagram. I'm going through all my pictures, and I realized that what I have more pictures of than anything else in the world is my dog. Same here. And, and so, my I decided, and here's the tip, guys. I decided that I was going to start an Instagram for my dog to cultivate the skill set of, one, thinking visually, and two, posting regularly and writing captions. Because if I can do it for my dog, where the content already exists because I have five years of photos then I can do it more regularly for myself because I don't take a lot of pictures. I just like, I'm not the kind of guy who's like doing something. I'm like, Oh, Hey guys, take a picture of us and let's post it on Instagram. Just now, I think it's a generational thing. I don't like, I don't walk around taking selfies, you know, and, um, but, but having my dog's Instagram force me to think along visual lines has allowed me to think more visually in general and from there have content for my Instagram. So there's your business tip. And the business tip is this, trick yourself. Sometimes you gotta trick yourself into doing things. And I'm gonna give you a tip for writing as well. Very, very few things are as scary for a writer as sitting down at a blank document. Sitting down at your, at your computer and opening up Microsoft Word is terrifying because now you got a blank document. So. If Microsoft Word is here, it's at the top in terms of like seriousness because it feels like work, one level down is being at your computer in an email client. So back in the day, I used to write a lot of my blog posts directly in Gmail and then just put them on my site. One step back from that is the note section, notepad on your computer. One step back from that is anything you do on your phone. And so if you really want to say, I'm not going to show you like, anything too close, but um, what you'll notice is that, let me see if I can get, get there. All right. So you see that I have in my notes just tons and tons and tons of shit. So like 99, per, okay, so here's like, um, yeah, okay. So here, the, the, the post that I put on Instagram about uh, working out only twice, I wrote that right here in my notes. Everything that I write goes in my notes first, and it's not because it gets saved automatically. The reason is that writing something on my phone in my notes feels very low stakes. It doesn't feel like it's pressure. And so I trick myself into writing great content by getting out of my own head. I don't have to sit there and be at my computer looking at this blank page and be like, oh my God, I can't believe I have to write a 3,000 word article. I just take out my phone and I just start typing some shit up and then eventually it gets long enough that I put it on the computer and go from there. And so that's the, that's the thing. Trick yourself. Sometimes, just like you do with your, your clients, where you trick them into, you know, like, whatever, you know, you trick them into getting more protein by telling them to put a scoop in their cereal or their oatmeal, yeah. you trick yourself. The same thing. You just build habits. And that is, that has been massive for me over the past couple of years. That is a, a massive tip there. And yeah, I, I find things like that. Evernote has been good as well. Whenever I get content ideas i just literally chuck a note in there or yeah. even if i'm driving i've got uh so in my car there's apple carplay yeah and i don't know they should put in the carplay that you can do a voice note but i end up sending a text message to myself but you have to actually uh, actually speak it out and like put your voice on it and with my accent it comes out with something crazy but at least i can understand it when i get there but on that note we said it would be about 30 to 40 minutes we've covered a good hour but it's been amazing content how can people, we know how they can get in touch with your dog and uh, <laughs> on uh, Instagram as well. Yeah. How can people get in touch with you if they want to talk about the writing, coaching, the mastermind yeah. or anything like that? Yeah. Um, honestly, the easiest way for any of it is just to hit me on Instagram DMs. Like that is where I am. It's crazy that, uh, that, that that's the case, but here we are in 2018. That's the easiest way to get in touch with me. It's basically slide like into the DMs as Gary Vee says. Slide right in the DMs. It's just like, like sending me a text, but, um, 
If you are interested in uh, the Wellspring Society, which is the mastermind, you can go to romanfitnesssystems.com slash mastermind, or I think it's even slash MM, and you, you'll yeah. get there. Um, and the writing coaching, honestly, like I, I have not even yet put up a like a page for it because everything comes from podcasts like this. It's word of mouth. I've gotten gotten a ton of referrals, and also like I'm sort of lazy, and I think everyone should be a little bit lazy and not do things just because you're supposed to. But when you have something like writing coaching, which isn't scalable, for me to sit down and like spend 30 hours writing like a kick-ass fucking sales page with amazing sales copy, like, great, but it doesn't matter how well it converts because I can only work with so many fucking people. Yeah. There's only so many. So it's like, I, I haven't put up a page for it, but if you're interested in writing coaching, uh, what I would want you to do is put together some samples of your work and uh, shoot me a DM and then we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do it. But basically we do it in calls of four to six to eight to 10 blocks. Uh, I, I don't like revealing price just because it's like not a good business thing, but it's, it's about half the price of what my normal business coaching calls are. Um, and the main thing is this, if I can, if I can over the course of 10 calls, teach you how to become a much, much better writer, uh, you're going to make that money back every time you publish an article, anytime you send an email to your list. And most importantly, I'm really good at helping people get published and like, there's, there's a lot to be said. Not only will Men's Health pay you $1,000 for an article, having that logo on your site is going to make you a lot more than that. So exactly. That's how I do it. That is amazing. So thank you for joining us. And, uh, yeah, I'll put all the information on the show notes. Perfect. Thanks so much, man. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate you listening. Thank you. Cool. That was really good content. I appreciate Thanks, that. Man. We went a bit on track, and then you're like, well, sweet. So, um, yeah, we've got a lot more actually covered than I thought. Cool. All right. So, I've got to run because I've got another call in 15 minutes and I'm going to try and eat something. Um, Enjoy. <laughs> so thanks, Ben. If you need cool. anything, I'll talk to you soon. All right, man. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.